Steelers OTAs are in the books and mini camp is up next. But before we talk about that, we want to talk about, we've talked about the, the Steelers offense, but what newest piece will be most valuable to the Steelers success in 2023 on the offense? We talk about that with Brian Badko, one of our Steelers beat writers who was there all OTAs long. And we'll talk about some Pirates with Jason Mackey after their folly at the hands of the Oakland A's. All here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast. A show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host Chris Carter here with Brian Batko, one of our one of our esteemed Steelers beat writers here at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, where you can get all of our content at post-gazette.com, and you can get this show, the North Shore Drive podcast, from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on your favorite podcasting app and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to this channel to get all of our daily content that comes out for the post because that and again our monday wednesday friday episodes of this specific show brian otas are done in the books but you still got one more week of mini camp before you can go on vacation and frolic whatever you wherever you guys frolic and shaler out there thank you for uh plugging my perfect attendance at otas i mean i was <laughs> i was striving for that i was always a the perfect attendance kind of kid back in elementary school too my parents were not the type to be like oh we'll take a vacation <laughs> in October and let you mind. miss days of school. No, that was that was not uh, not happening for your boy. So uh, that that's a long time coming. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I missed the an OTA session. So voluntary for all of us. But we were there. Absolutely. But let's talk about some of the things that we've seen now on the other side of the Steelers from OTAs because now the Steelers have several new pieces across the board but on offense there's a, there's all there's a specific group of guys who are new and are going to I think have a have a have the potential to have a big impact on this season and the question I pose for this episode is who will have the biggest impact now I am going to do away with the cheaters who are just going to say well Broderick Jones duh and and say okay yeah, I get it. The first round pick kid. Let's move him out the way. But let's talk about a few guys here that are new to the offense or have been around but haven't played yet. First, let's talk. We, we could talk about Isaac Siomalo, the free agent guard for they got from the Eagles. Allen Robinson, free is free agent wide receiver they got from the Bears. Um, you could talk about Darnell Washington being a backup tight end behind Pat Frymuth. Where will he be with Zach Gentry? That's a conversation. But then there's also Calvin Austin who was a fourth-round pick last year, and there was a lot of excitement about him going into training camp. He's still extremely fast, and there's there's that excitement around it, but he never played it down last year, didn't even make it out of training camp healthy. So I, I think you put all those names together on an offense that's very much still young in, 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 a, in every way. Uh, this there's also like Hakeem Butler, Chris. Hakeem Butler. Stop it. You got it. Listen, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You're I talked to, to him in the locker there. room on Thursday, and I'm like, was that? kind of, I like, kind of casually mentioned to him, I'm like, did you know that there was, there were kind of a lot of like diehard inside Steelers fans who were really excited and hyping you up, kind of coming out of the XFL, and he like was taking a swig of his Gatorade or whatever. I was like, really? Basically, I was like, <laughs> yeah, man, get to know the Steelers fan base, the people who are watching our YouTube show and following OTAs coverage wall to wall. Like they notice when yeah. a six foot six dude comes on board after the draft, right before OTA. So, uh, but he said he's really, he's been enjoying that part of it so far, but yes, I, I don't think that the, you know, late ad uh, will, will be the biggest addition to the offense, but let's, let's get into that a little bit. Let's get into it because if I was to go through all those names, you got two guys who will be battling to be the third wide receiver on the team in right. Austin and Robinson. And I guess like it's kind of like bracketed there. Like they'd be the first round of the NCAA tournament, you know, because whoever is if if a receiver is going to be the most important new part of this team, it's going to be one of those two. It can't be both of them. But then there's also Washington. There's also Siomalu. C- Where do you lean to in this discussion? You know, say Amalo would be an easy one to say because I think just the experience that he's bringing, he's, he's got the proven NFL resume and, and track record, and he's done it recently. But I, 
I just don't know that an interior lineman ever really moves the meter that much, at least for me. I think he'll be good. I think he'll be solid. He'll stabilize uh, the offensive line, and you know, I think he'll play more mistake-free football than they got out of his predecessor, Kevin Dotson, there. But I, I wouldn't put him in the you know biggest splash addition category. <clears throat> I think the upside is there for Darnell Washington just because of what the two tight end sets can help unlock for this offense. And, you know, I mentioned that in my mailbag um, that'll be online Friday at some point today as well. Um, you know, they like to use the 12 personnel and, you know, they started out in two tight ends, I think four times last year. I think that that really gets to the identity they want to have, but I'm just not sure that he's going to be able to make that kind of impact as a rookie so that, for me, narrows it down to the two receivers. And hard to say because he hasn't been too involved thus far, but I do think Allen Robinson has a, a little bit left in the tank to be that kind of slot possession guy, um, a very different type of player than Steven Sims was, obviously, in that role yes. a year ago. But I think a, a more a better fit for, for what they need at this point um, for Kenny Pickett and, and the way this offense is structured. So uh, like everything I've heard and seen from Calvin Austin, but you know, maybe he's a year away from making that kind of leap. Whereas Allen Robinson might have one year left in him, uh, you know, to, to really play right. uh, at a decent level. And, and I think he will be able to do that. It sounds like he's getting right uh, from that foot injury late last season. And, you know, he's even maybe ahead of schedule. Uh, based on on what he told me on Wednesday, right? And you wrote a great piece about this too, talking about Allen Robinson ramping up activity at Steelers OTAs ahead of mini camp, and you got to talk with him, and he's talked about his progress going from you know from individuals to seven on seven to full, and now he's he's feeling he's feeling ready. But I think it's also what Allen Robinson could make a big impact for the Steelers is not just on the field because when you talk to Calvin Austin about him, Austin called him quote unquote, a leader. He called him a, and you think about it. Allen Robinson is the elder statesman of the wide receiver group right now. And I think that that can't be overstated how it can, how important it is to have a guy in the locker room who can settle things down. I also think Allen Robinson is the type of veteran who, while Deontay Johnson is getting open his natural way, George Pickens is trying to make big plays. You need a smart guy who can line up in the slot and pick at the zones, pick at the weaknesses of defense defenses so that Kenny Pickett can have an escape valve in the offense. And if Allen Robinson can be that guy with his veteran savvy, I think that could make the case that you're making here that he becomes the most valuable new addition because he could be a stabling presence in the passing game for Kenny Pickett. Let's just be frank. I mean, to put it bluntly, when's the last time the Steelers had a grown up in the receiver room? I mean, Ooh. you know, Deontay Johnson and George Pickens, super talented guys, mm -hmm. but mercurial, not, not above the occasional uh, outburst or comment that makes you raise your eyebrows. We all know that Juju Smith-Schuster and Chase Claypool, I mean, they played their butts off for sure. Very competitive guys, but they were a little bit more on the immature side, I think. I mean, they were simply younger, too, yeah. uh, when they were here. So it's it's been a while since they had that grizzled veteran type of player. And, you know, there's something to be said for that, for sure. I think that's, that's a presence that's needed. Is it effective if you're not playing well on the field? Probably not. Um, you know, nobody's really going to want to listen to a guy who's not making plays or like, um, like Miles Boykin is a veteran, but also yeah. he doesn't play. He's a, he's he's a special team. teamer. Yeah. Gunnar Oshesky, same thing. I mean, those yeah. guys aren't, you know, they, they get their reps in camp in the preseason and, and, you know, they, they do fine with it, but I think we can all probably agree they're, they're not going to be, logging significant snaps when when they kick off week one against San Francisco at Acrisure Stadium. So, um, you know, and, and at this point, let's let's just be real. We don't know if Allen Robinson will either. I think positive signs are yep. are pointing that way for him, both physically and developing that early rapport with with Kenny Pickett. But um, yeah, I mean, they, they just I think they've needed that type of receiver for a while. They kind of tried to bring a guy of that ilk in a few years ago in Dante Moncrief. And right. going he, just, next. he just didn't have it anymore. Uh, we'll see if Robinson has it. He's he's not going to be the guy that he used to be. I, I At least I highly doubt that. 
Uh, Jerry Dulac also wrote about it, talking to Mitch Trubisky, uh, who had you know really a lot of success with Robinson when they were both with the Bears. But even he doesn't have to be that guy. Um, you know, George Pickens is is that guy for the Steelers. He reminds mm-hmm. you know Robinson of himself in a lot of ways. So uh, I think he's going to be somebody who ideally you know works well underneath, uh, shows more between the twenties uh, you know than he's been known for to this point in his career and. Uh, once you get in the red zone, maybe you can use him in the Allen Robinson of old ways um, because, you know, maybe he can do it well a few times per game, if not uh, being a top 100 player as he was ranked uh, a few years back by his NFL peers. I want to keep to keep going over the offense here and the new aspects of it that could help things and talk about how this relates to the playbook. And because that's one thing, as much as we could talk about the players, everyone's going to be like, but what about Matt Canada? We'll get to Matt Canada in just a second here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. But first, I want to talk to you guys about GameTime.co, our great sponsors, which is the best place to go get tickets for your favorite events, even if it's at the very last minute. GameTime is an app that you can download right to your phone, or you can go to their website, GameTime.co, and when you go there, they're going to show you the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. You can get killer deals on last-minute tickets, and they have a best price guarantee that just can't be beat, so you can stop stressing over the tickets that that are going to be super expensive and and start getting ready to get hyped for the fun that you're about to have at a great price. The Game Time app allows you to book tickets even up to the last minute, even if you didn't plan on everything and far out in advance. Happens to me a lot. Sometimes you miss miss something that's coming into town. Sometimes your plans change. Well, good, good. Yeah, here's where you get the good things because Game Time gives you exclusive flash deals on tickets from anything from football to basketball to baseball to concerts to comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less somewhere else, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference from the tickets that you got there. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PITTPIT for $20 off your first purchase or go to their website, GameTime.co. Terms, con- terms and conditions apply. Create an account and redeem code PITTPIT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko, breaking things down on the Steelers before we switch over to the Pirates in a, in a few minutes. But I want to talk to you, Brian, about some of those adjustments that we talked about. Allen Robinson being potentially a stabling presence in the wide receiver room, maybe a a, a kind of a, a guy who gets the, gets the tough yards, becomes the, the safety valve. Darnell Washington giving you more 12 personnel options there. Calvin Austin giving you a speed burner that you can put on the on the field. Isaac Ciamalo, and we'll throw Broderick Jones back in the mix now because it's not a cheat answer to just say him when we're talking most impactful new yeah, I mean, Whoever's playing left tackle in front of Kenny Pickett, I mean, they've, they've got a lot on their plate whether it ends up being Dan Moore or whether it ends up being Broderick Jones exactly but now that you have all these things here what is the biggest thing that Matt Canada has to open up from last year's playbook with the new additions that he that he has or is it even about the new additions and more so about hey you don't have a rookie quarterback anymore you need to open it up a lot of people I think would instantly go to using the middle of the field in in response to that question Chris but I like I'm not all that worried about that. I, I think that that's something that Kenny Pickett very much has in his bag, and I think he's got the uh, the, the candidates to uh, help him there. I mean, Pat Fryermuth took a, a huge leap forward to me from year one to year two. I mean, he's just rock solid. You you have a steady, dependable guy. Um, you know, I know that there are so many opinions across the world on the Pittsburgh Steelers that there are actually people out there who aren't big fans of Pat Fryermuth, but I feel like if that's the case, you're you're really just a hater at this point if, <laughs> if you don't think that that he's a, a solid player at the very least. So um, you know he'll be around for that part of it for sure. You know I just got done saying that I think Allen Robinson can um, you know rekindle his NFL career to some degree, being that type of of underneath player. Um, the the one that's interesting to me though more than uh, you know, hitting those slants in the seam routes is just f- finding a way to push the ball downfield, keeping defenses honest with the deep ball. Um, you know, that obviously is is always on the quarterback to some degree. It's always on the play caller and the, the design of the scheme to some degree. 
And it's up to the the players that you have in in that position personnel wise. And you know, yes, George Pickens, you you trust them on those uh, one on one balls, you know, contested catch beast. It's it's very difficult uh, to stop him in in those scenarios. But Deontay Johnson, I, I think, has been much more of an intermediate to short target to this point mm-hmm. in his NFL career. I, I don't think that's going to change for him. He's not getting any bigger, probably not getting any faster. I'm, I'm curious to see what Calvin Austin can bring in that regard. I mean, I, he's not like, you know, you're not going to design an offense around Calvin Austin. I mean, he was a fourth rounder a year ago, missed his whole rookie season. Um, you know, he's got the speed, but he's, he's still extremely undersized. But I think he, he could be the type of guy who helps – get the most um, out of taking the top off of the defense, opening things up, um, you know, across the middle uh, for that to be more successful and maybe even hit one or two uh, Mm -hmm. if he gets behind a a cornerback or a safety. So um, that's, that's something that is going to be very intriguing to me as we see this offense take shape. Um, You know, I'm not buying any talk of this being a, vastly different uh, system or anything like that. Matt Canada's playbook is what it is uh, to this point. And I still think the Steelers want to win with being a defensive minded run first outfit. But Mm -hmm. if you're going to be that, you do need to have the ability to occasionally hit on that quick strike, that big play that eluded them so often last year. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that, that the system isn't going to be too much different. I think just that, one, when you go back and you look at the All-22 of film last year, there were guys in the middle part of the field. The quarterbacks weren't throwing there. And I don't think they weren't throwing there because they couldn't see them, see them though sometimes I think that was the case, but not all the time. But I think that was part of the natural, you know, what? when you go, go to the middle part of the field, if you're not accurate, if you're not reading the defense, that's where you're going to get intercepted. That's where all of, I believe, all of Mitch Trubisky's three interceptions in the Ravens game that they lost came. And so when I look at that, and, I'm, and I look at that, I think that, that was part of just the scheme to do what you said last year: protect the football, make sure don't don't lose the game, let the defense win the game for you. But this year, I think there will be a little bit of a loosening of the, of the leash. I think that Kenny Pickett's going to be given the option to make some of those decisions. They'll have some of those things that that are designed up for him to take advantage of him. And I think he won't be being coached to to play it so safe. He still needs to play it safe. He still needs to play turnover free football as much as he can. Uh, because that's the, one of the biggest parts of the game. But I, I'm, I'm with you in that I don't think it's necessarily play calls that are going to change wholeheartedly. I think it's going to be about the opening up. And, and part of what Matt Canada is going to have to do this year to make this offense work isn't necessarily the plays that are called. And, and, and you know, and, and that's important. But I think it's going to be the working with the players to do what they're trying to uh, execute, what they're trying to, to pull out. Because there's times where – a coach can make a really great call that on the on the chalkboard, on the X's and O's, and on on the film, this guy was open, that guy was open. But if you can't get your players to see that that if your quarterback doesn't see that they're open, or the guy runs, you know, break, breaks off on his route a little too soon, and the and the pass goes in the wrong direction, you're not. It's still not a successful play. There still has to be something all on those lines that that has to happen, and they have to follow through. And I think that's going to be a big factor here with the new pieces and the old pieces that have stuck around for Matt Canada. From talking to all the receivers that I've spoken with during OTAs, I mean, they're all well aware of Kenny Pickett's style of play and how he can mm-hmm. extend plays, and he's going to be on the move both by design and in scrambles and, you know, Yes, there will be rollouts here, but there will also be times that he kind of tries to make something out of nothing. And you you need to have that innate awareness of where he needs you to be, uh, where he's going to look to run versus look back to throw. Um, so, I, you know, I think they've got the the tools in the toolbox to make those kind of plays happen and be successful. To me, it's more of the, you know, the the on time stuff. You know, can can Matt Canada scheme some guys open mm. more than he has in the past? Can Kenny Pickett? throw some guys open against, you know, disguised coverages. And just, again, you know, you need to design any good offensive coordinator is fitting what he does to the personnel that he has. And Matt Cannon always talks about that. You can reasonable minds can disagree on whether he does a good job of that. But, um, you know, everybody has heard him say in interviews with us that that's his MO. He's not trying to fit square pegs into round holes to do what he wants to do he wants to find mismatches 
get the right matchups and, and make sure they're taking advantage of that. So if that means, you know, Calvin Austin's playing on the outside because he's got that speed to, to stretch it, then, you know, find somewhere to put Deontay Johnson that, that he can get maybe a slot corner he can get open against and, and you know, do his work underneath. Um, you know, find a way to get George Pickens the ball, even if you have to force it to him when he's not open, but he's always mm-hmm. kind of open. So uh, it's also on Kenny Pickett to make those reads as well. And, uh, you know, we're obviously getting ahead of ourselves, but what are we going to do in, in early June when – That's what uh, this time still, is for, baby. We're still six weeks from training camp. We don't know what it's going to look like, and uh, we'll have a lot better idea of it come Latrobe. But – you're starting to see some of those initial building blocks uh, be put into place, that foundation being laid. I, I agree with you there. Part of that is going to be with those building blocks, finding ways for these players to mesh and actually move the ball down the field, however they do it, running the football, play action, middle of the field, sideline. There needs to be there needs to be some action and some life in this offense compared to where it's been the past several years for the Steelers. He's Brian Batko covering the Steelers for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we got Bucko Talk with Jason Mackey getting into what was a very disappointing season, a series with the A's and where the Pirates go next. That and more here in the North Shore Drive podcast. Stick with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the North Shore Drive podcast. We switch from football to baseball, where Jason Mackey has been all over the Pirates, as he always is for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. But the Pirates, what looked like at the start of the week, could be a great run for them. They had won six straight, winning the last two against the Giants and then sweeping the Cardinals, and then they won on Monday against the A's. They then lost by bad margins against what is... Uh, uh, what has been called the worst team in baseball and maybe one of the worst teams that we've seen in a long time in the Oakland A's at home 11 to 2 on Tuesday and then 9 to 5 on Wednesday they play the Mets this this series start uh, starting with uh 705 uh first pitch with Rich Hill on the mound we'll get to the Mets in a minute here Jason but I got to talk to you about this this A's series what really? the heck happens yes. even Mitch Keller got obliterated by this by this or by this ball club I know. I had something in my eye a little bit ago, Chris. I felt like the Pirates, where you just have something in your eye that you don't want there. And that was yep. what what happened with the A's, right? Like, they swept the Cardinals. Things were looking great. We're starting to talk about digging out of that May funk, and June's going to be so much different. And then, yeah, yeah, something gets in your eye, I guess. I, I mean, I look at that series, and I think this can go one of two ways. I really do. And it's going to be a tough opponent this weekend with the Mets. We'll get into that. But mm-hmm. You know, they can either bury this and say, well, it's baseball. The Braves got swept by the – or the Braves lost two of three to the A's, whatever. We move on. Not that big a deal. They can let it linger and get in their heads, and there are problems that developed over the course of that series that they don't correct. And you brought up one of them with Mitch, and that's a – I don't want to say a concern for me, but, I mean, they need Mitch to be like the ace version of himself, right, and not the poor version of himself that we had seen prior to last year. The starting rotation worries me a little bit. I saw that in the A series. Like, I think that there's the possibility if they get exposed, things aren't going to go so well. And, and we've seen this too. They play up to their level of competition. They've beaten some mm-hmm. really good pitchers. Keep that in mind. They mm-hmm. also tend to play down to their level of competition. And I guess mm-hmm. what that tells me is we're looking at a young team or a, a team that's not, you know, fully ready for contention or fully there. I mean, they have some young components, some old components, but you know, still kind of a flawed group in ways. I think it it makes you look back at April and be more impressed with how they, they stayed hot for as long as they did during that, during that month. But I wanted to ask you about that young team because young teams often are the most moved by momentum. When we talk about like when, when something bad happens, it can be, it can be completely destabilizing. If something good happens, it can be really rejuvenating. Yep. But what kind of ball club are the Pirates right now with the veterans that they brought in? We've talked even before the season about what the impact of veterans like McCutcheon, like Santana, like the guys they brought in to kind of help navigate through the tough times and navigate through the good times. Is this a ball club that can sustain a series loss like the A's and refocus, rebound, and then get back, back, they get back on it with a good series against the Mets and moving forward? 
I'm not sure we know for sure, Chris, but I will provide a couple examples that I think are interesting in how this team goes about its business. And this actually comes from the A's series, the victory in the A's series. After the game on the field, Andrew McCutcheon was asked by Robbie Inch Mikowski from AT&T Sportsnet about being in first place. Kutch was having none of it. That, mm. that, that's like borderline as angry as I've seen Kutch. Now, he also had an at-bat, um, I forget who it was against, late in the game where he gets buzzed up high with the fastball and nearly killed two other times. He wasn't happy about that. But right. he basically looked at Robbie and said, it's June. Relax. And like mm-hmm. that's where this group is in a lot of ways, and I love that. Like Rich Hill isn't all about talking – you know, playoffs or standings or this, that, and the other. Like they're talking about the process. Same with Kutch, same with Hedges, same with Carlos Santana. In that way, this group has never had anything like that. And so good, in my opinion. Like that's what buries an A series. At the same time, you also see sort of youthful exuberance and mistake making. G1 Bay, Rodolfo Castro, Jack Sawinski. They've all done things that have been really good and exciting. They've also struggled, be it on the bases, consistently swinging out of their shoes in the field blunders, hitting left-handers for Sawinski, like they've had problems. So again, I, I, that goes down a little bit of a, a, a tangent or rabbit hole or whatever in that they have something that they've never had before and I think will be helpful. It's just, is it enough to tug along everything else? It's, a, it's I think it's a big question right now, and it's something that could define their season. Um, you know, we were wondering how long would it take them to get out of a slump once they hit it when we were talking in April when they were winning the line, and it took them quite a while to get out of their slump. Um, not as long as it's taken some years because the Pirates have hit slumps that have just taken on multiple months uh, in, with some of the teams that they've had over the past several seasons. Uh, so I think the big question is, you know, finding that balance right now and you know, you talked about, you know, McCutcheon's saying, you know, talk, talking to Robbie and being being like, hey, like, you know, we're 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 not we're not celebrating. We're not popping any champagne for division leads in, in, in early June. I think that's very important. But I also mm-hmm. think it's important that they're sitting down with these guys and they're, and, and they're they're like, hey, we got to get after this. We got to get after that. We have to focus on on the things that, that are causing these problems. And like you said, like the A's even though they took two out of three against the Braves just very recently, like, you know, that, like, like I, I looked at that and I'm like, you know what, maybe they could do something there, but still, I feel like this was a team that the Pirates, we, as you and I even talked about on the Monday episode of this podcast, this was still a team that the Pirates needed to take two out of three against to show that they're headed in the right direction. They do get the Mets who haven't been playing great uh, com- coming up here. Uh, they're 30 and 33 right now, fourth in the NL East right at, at, at the moment. But at this at this point in time, when you can drop a series to the A's, I think it shows that there's no team that the, that the Pirates can really look down at right now and, and think, oh, this is going to be simple. We just got to do what we do. I think every series has to be a fight uh, on, on their part to test to test and find out who they are. Yeah, and they've sort of – I don't want to say back themselves into a corner with this one, Chris, but, I mean, if you take one of three, you're going to look at this homestand as a failure based on how it finished, right? Like – if they take two or three, I think it'll be okay. Obviously, if you sweep the Mets, you're going to leave here, you know, not even thinking about the A series and feeling really good going into division play next week with Chicago and Milwaukee. So, I mean, it's it it, it puts a lot more onus on this series. Um, and the one difficult thing, I don't know if we want to get into the Mets now, but I mean, they're not a team that beats themselves. They're mm. like the A's. We saw them, you know, handing out freebies left and right. Like they gave every opportunity for the Pirates to win some of these games. The Mets, they don't really do that. Um, they're the best defensive team in terms of errors, fielding percentage. They do that stuff well. Um, it looks like I'm seeing stuff on Twitter now as, as they're sort of updating things in New York. Um, Pete Alonso uh, may be headed to the injured list. Looks like he is headed to the injured mm. list. I mean, that's a that's a big time benefit big to the Pirates. I mean, you know, leading the NL in, in RBIs, leading everybody in home runs. So that helps, but I, you know, Starling Marte, no slouch. Like we, we, we know about what they have. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I see what the Pirates can do and how they can control things. And they do sort of control, I don't know, I, I, I'm trying to think of a different way of saying control their own destiny, but like get good starting pitching, play mm-hmm. clean defense, don't make stupid outs on the bases, and you need to hope that you hit with enough runners in scoring position and some opportunistic offense like they should be there but again if they you know self-inflicted wounds tend to really hurt this they have a path i think the, the way the way i'm thinking that what you're talking about here they have a path of winning that doesn't require the other team to stink they have a path yes. of winning that yes they, that they like you said control your own path 
control your controllables is something a lot of athletes across all right. sports say. And I think that that's where the Pirates are right now is if they do their job, they have a – it doesn't guarantee that they'll win games because, you know, it's, it's baseball. It's a long season. There, there's right. a, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of really good teams out and there. And their margin for error, too, is very thin, Chris. I mean, that's, right. that's the thing. Like, you have one or two of those things happen, and it's not great. You basically have to, like, check every box. Mm-hmm. But it is possible. It is possible. It is possible. And this Mets team, well, I, have, I have some friends who are Mets fans, and they're just, they are very frustrated with, with this team because this was supposed to be a better team for the New York Mets. What do they have to look out with here? The Pirates have Hill, Oviedo, and then Keller coming up on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on the mound. Yeah, um, a lot of different things. Um, number one, I, I, I guess with the Mets, Chris, this sounds weird to say that I would start with their offense. Like, I do think they're a pretty dangerous offensive team. Um, I think Lindor is still like very much there, not really somebody I would sleep on Nimmo, McNeil, Marte. Like to me, that's the thing that stands out the most. Um, their pitching has been good though, as well. I'm, I, I want to pull up some of their pitching numbers as we're talking, but, um, let me, give me, give me a second to get to this. No, you're I'll, fine. You're fine. Come on. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes, no. sometimes these things this is live production, baby, is when we be doing this. No, no, no. It's it's good. I just wanted to see the probables and who they're going to see. Like, you're going to see McGill and Senga. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's a quality team, man. I In ways, I don't understand why they're struggling. And maybe that's what your Mets fans' friends kind of – They are, they are, that, they are, they are over, the, they're over the roof right now, man. They're just like, how? How is this the year? Like, the pitching's not terrible. The offense is not terrible. They're They're – making the plays they should make in the field. I, I don't totally know. Um, but <laughs> I, I will say this, Chris, it, it mm-hmm. is so much for the pirates about starting pitching and when things go awry. And it, it's very easy to see like the last game out, Rowanzi Contreras gives up a run does or gives up seven runs, gets one out, doesn't make it out of the first completely disastrous. Like you have stuff like that. I mean, just forget about it. It's over, but you know, Hill Oviedo and Keller, I like the chances on them bouncing back and giving the Pirates enough with the starting pitcher. We'll see if they do that. He's Jason Mackey of the Pittsburgh Pirate Beat here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Find us at post-gazette, post-gazette.com and all the work that Jason does. Jason will be at the ballpark all weekend covering the Pirates in their series against the Mets. Will you be? Check him out at PNC Park. I'm Chris Carter, host of the North Shore Drive podcast. Big thanks to Brian Batko for all our Steelers talk. We'll be back Monday as Steelers get ready for minicamp, and we'll see how the Pirates did with their series against the Mets and how they, they face up against the Cubs coming up next week. We'll see you right here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.